Well, good morning again. We need the path of hope. And so, some thoughts on that topic here this morning, and I'll try to keep you all very much awake whilst we consider this. Hope is like a country path. It is. First, there's nothing. There's no path. But as you walk it, as you walk it, and the more people walk it, the path appears. And so it is with hope. If you learn to use hope, then you, the more you use it, the better it clearly will function. And the more it will be there. December the 10th, that was last Thursday. Does anybody here know what the significance was of last Thursday? It's a very important day. I'll bet you there's not even one person who would know. That's how important it is. It was World Human Rights Day. Do you know that? No, you didn't. That's bad, isn't it? Look at it. Look at it. Look at those hands. You can't read it. I know. I'll read it for you. Equality, freedom, peace, hope, dignity, uh, rule of law, prosperity, justice. That means for all mankind. December the 10th. Every year, it is a commemoration day. It is a universal declaration by the United Nations in 1948 of the basic human rights. That's what it is. That was in response, of course, to the war and the atrocities of the wars, Second World War, as they occurred. And there it is. So I hope you remember it next year. Stop human trafficking, the inhumanity against humanity. It's interesting that when you look at this, on December the 2nd, 2014, there was a meeting of certain conglomerates on this very topic of the abolition of slavery. And that would include human trafficking. Because human exploitation remains one of the obscene practices that is still happening worldwide in various continents. And it's a biblical concept that we should speak up. Open your mouth for the speechless. In Proverbs 31, verse 8 and 9, it says this. In the course of, in the course of all who are appointed to die, that's humanity, open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. That is what we need to do. That's a Christian principle. This man, Andrew Forrest, he was the former CEO of Fortescue Metal. He, um, he initiated that. And uh, he's actually the CEO and the founder of Walk Free, which sets out to, to, to liberate those that are caught up in this. And it was a very noble thing of him to, to organize. It was hosted at the Vatican. Where else? And um, they ended up with a joint declaration uh, some days later, at December the 5th, 2014. I want you to see what they decided. The joint declaration of religious leaders against modern slavery. Have a look at this. To commit to eradicating slavery by what? They got three more weeks to go. Less. Less. The meeting was part of a... Uh, Sixth institution plan to bring together the governments, the religious, and the multinational corporations of the world to end slavery, human trafficking, prostitution, and other forms of forced labor. And they said, we are, this is 2014, we are living in a world which is going to bring slavery to an end. That's what they said. But human exploitations, exploitations are still there. Prostitution, pornography, sex tourism, forced marriage, sweatshops, begging, armed services, migrant farming, and I think this one is one of the worst and most obscene ones that is still practiced in all the continents. Human exploitations is a terrible crime, not just against humanity, but also against God. 
The International Labour Organization, the ILO, estimates today we still have 14 million people, that's a lot of people, that are to be considered in slavery. 67 million are employed, same organization, as domestic workers. And the ones that are most vulnerable are, of course, the migrant domestic workers, MDWs, the migrant domestic workers who have virtually no rights and are so often misused and abused. And it's a terrible practice. 8.5, 80% of those 11.5 million are female. Slavery finds place in many forms, in many locations, agricultural, domestic work, factory sweatshops, uh, producing goods for global supply chains. And this is, this is where we are, all of us can be so guilty uh, in, in a sense as well. Uh, the Business and Human Resources right, Resource Center says this, that 83 major brands implicated are implicated in the report on forced labor, which is uh, in the various continents and various uh, countries, but particularly in China. Of the ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, which is the northwest of China, the Uyghur, which are a minority group, and other ethnic minority groups are employed, assigned to factories, and that is underwritten by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, noting this to be verifiable and factual. It's amazing. It's amazing the world we live in. It's not getting better. This is the point. Why am I doing this? What I'm trying to tell you, it isn't really getting any better. There's a joint declaration that, that they made, and I want to read it because the wording is so good. The joint declaration of the religious leaders was this. We, the undersigned, are gathered here today for an historic initiative, they said, to inspire spiritual and practical action by all global faith and people of goodwill everywhere to eradicate modern slavery across the world by 2020, as I said. This was stated in 2014 for all time. In other words, never to be returned to this practice. In the eyes of God, each human being, each human being is a free person, whether girl, boy, woman, woman or man, and, and it is destined to exist for the good of all inequality and fraternity, modern slavery in terms of human trafficking, forced labor and prostitution, organ trafficking, and any relationship that fails to respect the fundamental conviction that all people, that all people are equal and have the same freedom and dignity is a crime against humanity. And we can all say amen to that. Isn't that true? We all concur with that. We pledge ourselves here today to do all in our power, they said, 2014, within our faith communities and beyond, to work together for the freedom of all those who are enslaved and trafficked, so that their future may be restored, that we have the opportunity, and I like this, the awareness, we have certainly the awareness, the wisdom, they claimed, the innovation that was proposed, and technology to achieve this human and moral imperative. They said we can do it in 2014, when there were about 31 million slaves by the same estimate, by the same institute. We're now having 40 million. Proves one thing, doesn't it? Proves one thing. When we depend on organizations, we get what organizations can do. Is that fair? Now, now when, we, when we depend on education, we obviously get what education can do. Uh, when, we, when we depend on men, we can, only, we can only hope for what men can do. It is when we turn to prayer, that's different. We can get what God can do, and that's the difference. But today, we're not living in a better world. Hope. Faith accepts the gift of the promise. It does. It does. And hope is confidently expects the fulfillment of the promise, and that's fair enough. Three types of situations for people when it comes to hope. 
There are those who have no hope. We just talked about them. Those who are still enslaved and exploited. It hasn't happened. There are those who have false hope. That's a lot of people in the world that have false hope. And then there are those who have true hope. And we love to think that we are in that category. Isn't that right? We have this hope, haven't we? Yes, we do. False hope seems to be self-sufficient up to a point until the testing time come. And then it turns out that a false hope is actually much worse than no hope at all because of the bitter disappointment you may suffer. Far worse. Far worse than no hope at all. Story that I'd like to share with you, it's some, to illustrate something. So if you bear with me. It involves a plane, passenger plane, twin engine, larger plane. Um, it's getting dark. It's approaching its destiny. And it is just about ready to go for landing to descend. And uh, it's only 20 minutes away of that, that landing. And so there's an interaction between the traffic control tower and the, and, and the captain of this, of this particular plane. Now, something happened. The rudder of the plane didn't work. It was malfunctioning. So the captain radios in to the, to the control tower and he said, he said, I have a problem. My rudder is not working. It is malfunctioning. What am I going to do? And the control tower radios back. Stay calm. Don't panic. Repeat after me. Wind flaps, check. Altitude, check. Speed, check. And they went through everything. And then the plane got restored, and it was on track, and it was ready, getting ready for descent, for landing. Five minutes later, five minutes later, there's another call from the captain to this traffic control. And he's shouting, my starboard engine is stalling. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Traffic control gets back to the captain. Stay calm. Stay calm. Don't panic. Repeat after me. Check the wings. Check altitude. Speed, check. And he talks him into the situation that these planes can actually fly on one engine. And he's stable. And he's coming in for descent to land. And you guessed it, there's another call. <laughs> Things are not going well for this captain. Mayday, mayday, mayday. My other engine stopped, stalled. What am I going to do? Air traffic control gets back to him. Don't panic. Don't panic. Stay calm. Say after me. Our Father who art in heaven, <laughs> hallowed be thy name. Why am I telling you this? If everything else fails, try God. The moral of the story, why not try God first? You get in your car and you hope for a safe journey. How often do you take that extra bit of time to say, Lord, save me, spare me. Guide me, keep me. Good investment should do that. And there are so many, there's millions of ways that we can involve God absolutely first. And we should. The apex of the Sermon on the Mount is so fascinating. It's really the pinnacle of the Sermon of the Mount, which you find recorded in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verse 13 and verse 14. Have a look at this. 
enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy, notice, that leads to destruction. You know this verse, but you stay focused. That leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I want you to have a look at this verse. It's a brilliant statement. It's a brilliant assessment that Jesus gives here. What he is explaining to them is the path of hope. That's what he's explaining. Now, those who find it, so you've got to look for it. That's number one. You've got to look for it. If you don't look for it, you won't find it. It's that simple. Then there is another thing that you've got to bear in mind. There are four contrasts. It's brilliantly put together. You have a narrow gate. Yeah? You have a narrow gate. You have a wide gate. You have a, a narrow way. And you have a wide way. You have uh, two groups of travelers. They all go to the direction where it says to heaven. But both roads don't go there. One of them is the white road. They're not going to heaven. The other one is the narrow road. That's the path to take. And there are two groups, as I said. One are the many, and the other one are the few. You have four contrasts here. The emphasis is to enter. And here, I just want to dwell on this verse a little bit. And I hope you stay with me. The pinnacle of the Sermon on the Mount is really this. You know that gate, the gate, the gate, comes first. The narrow gate comes first. If you're on, you think you're on the narrow path, but you have not entered through the narrow gate, you're on the wrong path. Get that? You have to enter the narrow gate. And there's a reason for it. In the Hebrew language, gate, door, used interchangeably, has a word called sha'ar. I love that word. You find that in Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he, a man, thinks in his heart, that's in his mind, so is he. Is that true? That's absolutely true. As you think in your mind, that's what your mind is stayed on, that is how you become, that is how you are. Now that word think is exactly the same word, sha'ar. Because to the Semitic mind, your thought is a doorway. And a doorway is a set, a mindset. Do you get that? Uh, let me give you the sanctuary. The sanctuary, as you come to the door of the sanctuary, the curtain in the portable one, it is a, it is a, it is a sha'ar, it is a gate. You need a certain mindset. And then you go from, from the courtyard into the holy place. You need, you need a sha'ar, that is a certain mindset. And then, and then there is that ultimate, that is that ultimate on the 10th day of the seventh month, you go through from the holy place into the most holy place. And again, it is sha'ar. It's fascinating. It's very interesting when you think of that. Very interesting. The gate comes first. The narrow gate must come first. And you must enter. Enter the narrow gate. Enter is in the imperative. You have to enter. You have to enter. And really, you should do that now. And I like to think you've done this already. The significance of the narrow gate is so great. Have a look at this. Jesus said this. He says, I am the door. You remember that? He said that? Now, it comes to us to the Greek, but I'll bet he used the word sha'ar, that he explained that. I am the door. Uh, here in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, Jesus really 
is the narrow door, if you like, leading to the path of hope. Now, you've got to go through him. You've got to go through him first. You cannot bypass him. You can't get on the narrow way that leads to life unless you go through the narrow door. Have a look at this. You enter alone. That's the other truth. You enter alone. You don't enter as a couple. You don't enter as a family, not even as a church family. You don't certainly don't enter as a denomination. It is a singular decision, a singular action. You must step out and you must make that move. You must get yourself through the narrow gate. And maybe, I'll keep uh, reminding you, it's narrow. Maybe this is an illustration. Have you ever seen one of those? You know what they call these things? Does anybody know? Yeah, now you do. Turnstile. I never knew that. See, on the, on your, the right hand side, you can see, you can see there's only one person that can get through at a time. Here's another thing. Imagine if you had suitcases, you had a lot of luggage. You don't get through that door. You with me? Neither will you when it comes to the narrow gate that leads to the narrow pathway. You have to leave your baggage behind. Your self-confidence, your self-evaluation, your, your, your preconceived ideas, if you like, all the luggage, your, your desire for this, your desire for that, your ambition for this, your ambition for that. You have to leave that behind. You cannot take that through that door, the gate, the narrow gate. Do you understand that? That is the narrow gate. And so you remember the rich young ruler. He didn't make it. The rich young ruler could not get through the narrow gate. Why? He had two suitcases. One was full of his money, and the other one was, oh, I've kept all the commandments. Self-righteousness. It's a killer. That's it. And yet he broke all the commandments. The summary of the first four, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind. The next six to love your neighbor as yourself, not him, not him. Oh, he was a Sabbath keeper. I'm sure he was. But that doesn't necessarily get you home, does it? And so he broke, he didn't realize that every law. When Jesus gave the list of the laws, he left out the coveting. That's interesting. And he could argue that he didn't covet his neighbor's house. He probably didn't because he already owned it. That's the situation. You can covet what you possess. That, you can do that. And it doesn't have to be a lot. But if it comes first, it's coveting. He couldn't, he couldn't get through that door. He could never get onto that path. His money, his position, his prestige, and his self-righteousness with the luggage that wouldn't go through the door. You know, a narrow pathway. Um, it's also one way. That's another thing. It's one way. Can you remember that? The narrow path is one way. Now, now, I like this picture. Very narrow. Have people ever told you, have people ever told you then, you know, those people, people, you people, they say then, or you, you are very narrow-minded. Have you ever been told that? Yeah? You know what the answer is? It's the answer I always give. Yep, I am. Because I want to be on that narrow road that leads to life. Fair enough? Of course we are narrow-minded. Life is Christ is an endless hope, but life without Christ is a hopeless end. You run into a brick wall. That's all you do. Hope. Hope. I like some of the statements that Jesus made. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. 
How many people do you know that would lay down their life for yours? Jesus did. He did. That certainly gives me hope. Uh, I will never leave you. Remember the statement? He made it a number of times in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Nor forsake you. I mean, you can go to Genesis, you can go to Deuteronomy, to Joshua, and you can even go to the New Testament, to Hebrews, the 13th chapter. The promises of God are there. He will never leave you. And that's a certainty. He won't. I like this statement. It came to pass. Yeah, you've heard it uh, so often. You read that in the Bible. It came to pass. Let me tell you, when I saw this one, it reminded me of a story that I want to share with you of a pastor, and I, I, I think it was a Baptist church, but it doesn't matter. And this pastor, on the, the evening of the day of worship, he decided... He just, uh, they have a bit of a social, if you like, and he decided to ask his prisoners, what got you through the difficult times, the trying times, the hard times, the suffering times? What got you through? What got you through? The young guy gets up and he says, oh, pastor, for me, it's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the middle-aged lady comes up, and I think it was Psalm 46. He said, oh, he, he's, a, he's a help in, in present need. He, he. And then others came and quoted what the, the verses I just showed you. I will never leave you. The other one is because the Gospel of John. Uh, you know, in the world you will have tribulation, but don't fear, of course, I have overcome the world. And these are all texts that really really build you up. And that's quite interesting, quite a collection of texts. And then, then there is an old man sitting near the front. His name is John. He's 92. He's 92. And so the pastor turns to him and he says, Now, John, what got you through difficult times? And he quoted just that, what you see on the screen. It came to pass. When he said that, people were sort of laughing a little bit, you know, snickering, maybe John's memory is not as good. He didn't remember the rest, but he did. He said, it's in the Bible 396 times. I've read them all. 396 times it came to pass. And he had a different spin on it. He had a different interpretation. Uh, but it'll become plain to you. And then he gave the story. He said, he said, Pastor, when I was 30 years of age, I had a wife. I had uh, five children. I lost my job. It was terrible. It was terrible. I, I was desperate how to provide for them. But I remember what, Jesus, what the, the Bible teaches. It came to pass. It will pass. That's how he interpreted it. It will pass. It will pass. When I was 40, he said, my oldest boy who had gone to the war died. He had died in the war. It was devastating. Devastating. We got through it. We got through it. It came to pass. It Passed into the past, we came through it. At the age of 50, a house burned down. Nothing was saved, nothing. All gone. Had to start all over again. That was terrible. But we got through it. It all came to pass. It all came to pass. At the age of 60, my wife of 40 years was diagnosed with cancer. He said, I remember the nights that we, as the cancer slowly ate away her health. He said, I remember kneeling at the bedside, praying, pleading with God, please let us stay together. Please let us stay together. Many nights we cried. At the age of 65, she died. Still miss her. 
still miss her. But pastor, it all came to pass. It all came to pass. He gets you through it. He gets you through it. This text was my strength. I quite like that. I quite like God doesn't always remove the hardship and the difficulties. But he gets you through it. He does. He does. Hope. Memory lane is nice. Memories connect us with the past, but it's hope. It is hope that connects us with our future. That's important. Apostle Paul, just a few quotes. The Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, and, and the father did, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He does. He does. Now, he says this. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. You may abound in hope. Hope is a Christian principle and it should have an application in your life. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give that. Therefore, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God can do all that. All things have passed away. You know the text. Behold, all things have become new. The changes that God can bring about, the Bible commentary that we have is the most outstanding commentary that I could recommend for you to use every time you have a Bible study. Fantastic scholar, F.D. Nickel. He had 28 other scholars working with him when they compiled the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary. Very, very good. About the new nature. This is important. This new nature, and I like the way they put it, is not the product of moral virtue presumed by some to be inherent in man. You don't have that capacity inherently. Of course, otherwise you have false hope. You understand? The Jews had false hope. Abrahamic descent would get them across the line. No, it won't. No, it won't. Your denominational choice will get over the line. No, 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 no. Your family, no, not your family either. False hope is terrible. So the, the, the new nature is not the product of moral virtue, presumed to be uh, inherent in man and requiring only growth and expression. That would be wrong. There are thousands of so-called moral men, many, many, who have no particular confession of being a Christian. In fact, the reality is they're not new Christians. They're not new, uh, not born again. They're not new creatures. The, na the new nature is not merely the product of a desire or even a resolution. Notice to do right. It's, not, it's, it's far more than this. I love the way that they put it because it is so true. It's not even a mental assent to certain doctrines or an exchange of one set of opinions or feelings for another. No, 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 no. Or even a sorrow for sin, which is a good start but not sufficient because it needs a turning away as well. And you're never going to do that by yourself. I like this. It is the result of the presence of a supernatural element introduced into man. You don't innately have it. It's not indigenous to your makeup. You need a supernatural element that can only come from above. Folks, it's true. This is true. Which results in his dying to sin and being born again, therefore. Love, love that statement. Thus we are created anew in the likeness of Christ, adopted as sons and daughters of God, and set on a new path, the path of hope, the path, the narrow path that leads to life. That is what it is. What a pathway this was, the exodus, the parting in the Red Sea. I wish I was there. I think. No, it's fantastic. 
A wall of water over here, wall of water over there. There's an army behind you, but then God is between that and the army. And you walk on dry ground, and, and the light is there as well. Marvelous what, what happened there. That was the path of hope. I think of Joseph, the man he was a prisoner, he was sold off uh, in, in, as, as a slave, and the unfairness. Uh, yes, he, he, he didn't deserve what he got, did he? In no way at all. Everybody liked him, including Mrs. Potiphar. Wrong reasons. But here we have a man, uh, the Sabbath school lesson. You're working as you're working unto the Lord. That's what he did. He was so good at it. Here's another one. Very similar story, but much later. Uh, the Daniel, again, prisoner. Second in charge of an empire. Can you believe it? Because he put God first. Wonderful. These guys had a, were narrow-minded. They were narrow-minded. They worked unto the Lord and for the Lord. And the wonderful things that they achieved. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, he ended up in the lion's den, but here it is prophetic. There will be a time like the three worthies in the fire that God will protect his people, the close of probation, that there will be no more dying, that there is no more purpose in that. God can do that. We, you, me, we are on a path of hope. You listening, you are on a path of hope. You are. Steve McQueen. How many of you remember him? That's it. Yeah, there's one, there's one, there's another one. It's an admission of AIDS, isn't it? He only was 50 years when he died. Mom was an alcoholic. The, the variety of stepdads that he had, one was worse than the other. He never could find a father figure. Until he well into his, uh, well into his career, he was wealthy, and he bought, uh, he collected planes, old planes, World War II planes, you know, and World War I, I think it was. Anyway, there was one that he bought, and he particularly uh, wanted to learn how to fly that. And there was a man uh, who used to fly them in the war, and of course much older than Steve, and his name was, um, was Mason. Uh, I think it was really Mason was the man's name. And this man taught him how to fly the plane, and as he, as he taught him, uh, Steve McQueen became very impressed with the personality of this, this, uh, this man, this Willie Mason. And one day, uh, when they finished the training session, he said, I want to talk to you. You know, you're one of the most exceptional people I know. You're always kind. You're always cheerful. Uh, you always consider it. Nothing is a bother. Nothing is a problem. You are perceptive. You listen. What is that about you? <laughs> and William Mason said, well, I don't know. Maybe because I am a Christian. And Steve McQueen said, a Christian? He said, yes, I am. I think he was a Baptist. And he... Um, the men started to talk, and they talked for hours. They talked for hours about Jesus. Willie Mason explained to him what it means to have Jesus in your life. He, he explained to him what it means to get through the narrow gate, you see, how to get onto the narrow path. He explained it to Steve, what it does for you. Life opens up. Life really opens up. And Steve McQueen said, what about forgiveness? Oh, forgiveness, yeah, that's included. That's included. Do you know that he ended up accepting an invitation by Willie Mason and his wife to come to their church? And he did. Steve McQueen went to church. His wife, Barbara, I think her name was. And he met the, uh, the pastor there. Ultimately, he met the pastor there. And Leonard DeWitt was the pastor. I still remember the name. And he invited this pastor to come to his place. And the pastor said, well, you know, tell me your story. And he told him the story, the discussions that he had with Willie Mason and, and how he got into the Bible and how he, how he prayed and how he pleaded for forgiveness because, oh, that was a long list. And, and, and the assurance of forgiveness. The, you know, the wonderful thing about us is this. We have the assurance of forgiveness 
if we enter the narrow gate. Clean slate. You can get sick of sinning. There's a narrow path. And he keeps you on it. Anyway, Steve, listen to that. And then, sadly, some six months later, there in uh, uh, 1979, he was diagnosed with cancer. It was not the smoking, the cigarette is, (laughs) you know. Uh, That wasn't it. It was actually asbestos uh, exposure that, that, that caused that. And so, and so as he began to deteriorate, at one stage he, he had a request. He wanted to meet with Billy Graham. Now, you all know Billy Graham, right? Because he, he had watched him on television, and he wanted to talk to him. And, and somehow, yeah, he's a busy man. Steve had always been too busy as well. But now he really desired to talk to Billy Graham, to see him face to face. And he made known the request. And Billy Graham was not far away. At, I forgot now which city it was, at the airport. Well, Steve McQueen sent uh, uh, his driver and collected him, brought him to his house. And he was, he was very poorly at the time when that happened. This was only shortly before he died. And uh, Billy Graham said as he walked in, he, he, he didn't recognize him. Terrible the way that cancer can ravage the body. But Steve McQueen, was, his eyes were lit up. He said, this is wonderful. I have been, you know, I have been wanting to see you. I have heard you on the television. I have listened to your crusades. He said, he said you know what? Every time I, I listen to you and every time I watch you, I, I started to drink. Graham said, you did? He said, yes, because I wanted to be what you told me I should be. I wanted to be that, but I couldn't pay the price. I was not willing to give up. I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. And so I drank to get rid of my guilt. And he said, now there's a Bible text I want to show you. And and he couldn't find his Bible. And Billy Graham got his Bible out of his pocket, the one he carries all over the world. Little pocket book. And he he said to Steve, you can have this one. It's got on it Billy Graham. In fact, he got a pen out and he wrote it to my friend Steve McQueen. Yours. Marked everything, study Bible. And he was so grateful. And he said to Billy Graham, will you pray with me? Ah, yes, sure. Of course I pray with you. And they prayed. They prayed. And a peace came over that man. A peace that can only come from the one who said, Peace do I give give unto you. Not as the world do I give unto you. And Billy Graham left. Four days later, Steve McQueen died. In fact, it's interesting that little Bible was open, and uh, reportedly, Titus 1, verse 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time begun. Do you get the message here? He died on November the 7th, which happened to be the date of birth of Billy Graham. He was 62. What a story. Story. Great story. Great story. Whatever you're chasing in your life, young people, whatever you're chasing, whatever you're chasing, nothing compares to God himself. Is that right? Nothing compares to that. So from the manger to Calvary, amazing. From the manger to Calvary, what a path of hope. I just want you to remember as you walk out of here, Jesus is our path of hope. He is the narrow gate. He is the door. He is the path, the way, the truth, the life. He is the narrow, the narrow path. He is the path of hope. And may it be true for every single person here. Let's bow our heads. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement, the assurances, the promises. We thank you for the door that is possible to enter because Jesus entered first and then he walked the narrow pathway all the way to Calvary. He went before us so we can get there as well. Lord, we thank you for the gift of eternal life. We thank you for everything that you have done for us. Help us to respond. Make that surrender if we haven't as yet. And one day soon that we will see you. And what a day that will be. What a day that will be. We pray for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you.